Hey, it's Sonia, and welcome to the Smarter Podcast. Today, you and I are going to learn how to make money off of a podcast. And I'm not just talking something that you can do as a part time thing or a hobby. I'm talking full time, something that you can dedicate all your passions into. So I have one favor that I want to ask you right before we get into it. And that is whether you're having a coffee at a terrace or taking a walk or driving to work, whenever you are listening to this right now, just make sure that by the time the conversation begins, you're going to make a mental note for yourself of how to make money from a podcast. Oh, did I say one favor I wanted to ask you? Because I kind of meant two. And here's why. I just think it's great that you're listening to something that can take you from a dream to a reality and unveil your passion, even if it is just for one of you. So this is why it would mean so much to me if you know someone that is interested in podcast, be it a friend or a family member that you know is passionate about this topic, if you can go ahead and share this episode with them. Because I just believe that it is so cool that you get to listen to all of this knowledge for free. And in just about an hour, you're going to learn how to build, monetize, and make money off of your podcast, even though you have zero listeners. So thank you one more time. I've had the immense honor to sit down and chat with the acclaimed entrepreneur, speaker, and best-selling author, Jason Allen Scott. Let me tell you a little bit more about himself before we dive deep into the conversation. Having built and sold companies on three continents, Jason intricately weaves stories of setbacks and triumphs while advocating for individual empowerment. His feature on Forbes as an innovator and revolutionary place among the top 100 most influential people in events are testaments to his mastery. Jason is the founder and the creator of Podcasting for Business, a step-by-step podcast launch, growth, and monetization blueprint for business owners who want to amplify their vision, voice, and monetize their show. Through his first show, The Guestless Podcast, Jason honed the art of storytelling and demonstrated the immense power of strategic podcasting. Jason Allen Scott is more than just a business leader. He is a catalyst ready to captivate you with his wisdom. Hi, Jason. Thank you for being on this podcast. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. All right. I want to build up the first question because I'm going to go deep from the very start. Jason, I discovered your work via the Tiny Business Big Money book, which I have over here, um, where you are featured, which for the ones listening that don't know what it's about, it's basically a a book that talks about businesses that have reached $1 million, mainly with one person running the show. Jason, you've built and sold companies over three continents. You're obviously a very perseverant person, and I have to say congratulations, first of all. (laughs) Thank you. To get to sit down and talk with you is, is just a pleasure. So many people don't even know that you can sell a podcast. And I think you're the first person that I sit down and talk to that has done just that. So let's dive right into how do you do it? Where does your inspiration come from? Where do you get all of the creativity for creating the new work that you put out there? A great question. Um, <laughs> I Originally, I'm from Cape Town, South Africa. And South Africa is a place that if you don't build, you die. So mm-hmm. Oglevy, famously the advertising giant, once said, if you don't sell, you die. Now, that's true if you're in a developed country, because everything already exists. All you need to do is sell a product or a service, and then everything else kind of works. But in Africa, where I'm from, there isn't that infrastructure to allow mm-hmm. that to be so- PayPal didn't come to South Africa until it was in every single other country in the world because 
PayPal needed FedEx to deliver the goods that was sold from eBay, which means eBay needed to exist, which mm -hmm. means that it, the internet needed to work, which means that people needed to have laptops to connect to the internet, to be able to find things, to be able to buy things, to be able to sell mm -hmm, things, to be able mm -hmm. to pay on PayPal, to be able to deliver to your house. So all that had to be built before PayPal could move over. And we as Africans have to build it. So I think that idea of always knowing that you have to build to survive, that you have to build to live, allowed me at a very early age to realize that if I wanted anything, no one was coming to save me. No one was coming to help me. Um, I, I grew up in a, a poor white community. There's over 7,000 of us in the whole of South Africa with over 44 million people, supposedly, according to the government. I think there's a lot more than 7,000 of us. Um, and you would rely on your ability to think your way out of things because you couldn't work your way out of things. There's only so much time that we had. There's only so much, you know, outputs that we could put out in that much time. So I, I spent time in libraries. I spent time asking questions. I tried to find as many people who were successful as I could. I still do to this day. And I just asked as many questions as they would allow me to do, which is why I take the time to do podcasts like this, because I think this is where it all begins. And mm -hmm. as for the question, how do you sell a podcast? I've now sold two podcasts. Um, I think one of the other things I learned really early is that I was lied to as a child. It's not about equality. It's not about people being equal. It's about equity. It's about owning something. So when I got my first, uh, my second show, which was called Smarter Event Planning, I got a, I did the usual. I started off with, a, you know, selling products and then services, then consulting, then coaching, then okay. merchandise. And I got 37 different ways to make money from a podcast. Um, eventually I realized that actually, if I was going to make real money from this, I should try and own somebody else's company. I should own a piece of that company. And then when I'm helping that company to do better, when I'm helping that company to sell more of their product or service, I should get a piece of that. And that is normally referred to as affiliates, right? You have a link, you say, hey, if you were listening to this podcast, go to this link forward slash name of the podcast, mm -hmm. you get 20% mm -hmm. off. And you as the podcast host get 20% or maybe 10%. The most successful affiliate, by the way, if you're listening to this, is AG1. Every time AG1. someone buys, yeah, Athletic Greens, every time someone buys $150 worth of AG1, the podcaster is getting $50 wow. per month. Forever, for as long as I buy that product, you will get $50. So someone like Joe Rogan, 20 million people listen to that podcast. Let's say 10% mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of that by AG1. That's 2 million people. If 2 million people are buying that, he's getting $50 per person times 2 million. That's a bigger amount of money than he got from Spotify at 100 million to swap over from YouTube to Spotify, right? That's an affiliate. So I wondered, well, if that's true, what if I owned a percentage of athletic grades? What if I could get 10% of the company? And then I want to promote it even more than just promoting it monthly. So I went to my headline sponsor and I said, it's currently costing you X every single month to support my podcast. What if you just gave me a percentage of the company and help me? I can help you with rewriting the website, coming up with the newsletter. I can do all the marketing pieces as well. So I really know that my contribution makes sense. And then we can interview people that will help the business grow even better. And I can promote the podcast where the people are on it and I can create case studies for you. And they said, okay. And then I sold the entire show for a piece of that company. Wow. And the second time I did it, I was in a, I did a crypto blockchain podcast called not another crypto show. And this time I was like, okay, I could do equity plus cash thinking that the worst they can say is no, um, or on, we'll only give you cash or we'll only give you equity but I knew that there was an audience that cared, an audience that were fans. So there's a very big difference between an audience and fanship. An audience listens to something. A fan pays for something. So I listen to Taylor Swift. I'm not embarrassed. I like to be like, <laughs> I'm not a fan of Taylor Swift. I don't own a T-shirt or an album or a CD. I don't, I don't go pay for her concerts. That's what a fan will do. And you don't need many fans to make a lot of money. In fact, mm -hmm. when that company bought my show, not another crypto show, we use the podcast to get in front of the audience, to drive the audience to go to a page and invest in our company. And we ended up raising 2.1 million US dollars from our audience. Wow. wow. Yeah. <laughs> so. You left me speechless, Jason, I have to admit. <laughs> right from the very start. 
you you really shared about everything that we're going to uncover today. <laughs> so congratulations. I never really thought, and I think I say this for everyone listening as well, how much you can scale up a podcast. And many people actually consider podcasts as being just a side hustle or a side hobby, something that you can't really do full time. And here you are proving all of them wrong. <laughs> so... I want to shift you in the direction of a person that already has a podcast up on any plot platforms. Say they've been doing it for around a month. How do you scale it up? How do you scale the podcast? When is the right time to start monetizing? And perhaps how do you even monetize? So that's an excellent question. And it's nuanced. And what do I mean by that? I mean, it has multiple sides. Hmm. So... First is understand that a podcast, a business podcast, by the way, which is very different to a mm-hmm. podcast you do for a hobby, right? You, every single podcast, I feel, um, should be connected to a business because I think you have limited time and you should get something back for your time. Now, sometimes that just means you get to talk about your favorite TV show with your best friend on a podcast. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. And it can stop like that. But you could also then you know do t-shirts around that show and you could so you could still make money out of that show so it should it still is a business mm-hmm. so it's not costing you anything I'm a, I'm a firm believer in that that our time is so limited so you need to understand that's the first piece the second thing you need to understand is that a pod, a business podcast as we said is a, a different to a hobby podcast is both an email and social media okay so why was email amazing This is way before your time, but email was amazing because it connected me directly to my client, to my customer. Mm -hmm. I could now talk to you directly. So it was very similar to mail. It still is. That's why it's called email, right? It's electronic (laughs) mail. Social media came, which was the next phase and said, well, instead of talking one-to-one, you can talk one-to-many. So instead of me just talking directly to you, I can put something online. Let's use Twitter as an example. And suddenly thousands of people can see it. Hundreds of thousands of people can see it. Facebook said millions of people, billions of people mm-hmm, can see it. Mm-hmm. So we suddenly understood that we could do one-to-many. Podcast allows me to go one-to-one, me to you. And then you then put this on platforms and it becomes also one-to-many. That's the power of podcasting. So as a business owner, I begin by selling to you. That means that if not a single person listens to this podcast and I still convince you to buy my product or service, this podcast is profitable and I've made money out of it. Yeah. And that's the first thing you need to understand. There's only five ways to make money from a podcast. And then there's a flywheel that creates 10 and then 15 and then 20 and then 25 and then 30 and then 35 and then 37 is what we currently at. So that's the next thing you need to understand. You then take a step up from that. And you realize that it's not about the number of people. There's this real idea that you need to scale up numbers. I was on a stage with Lewis Howes. Lewis had just come off Ellen DeGeneres. He had 190 million downloads. Wow. Exactly. Can you imagine having that many people listen to your show? At the time, my show, which had won most profitable small business in the UK, top 100, had only two and a half thousand downloads. And I was thinking, why am I getting on stage with this guy? This is crazy. He's like, he's like the the pros and I'm like an (laughs) amateur. And then he said something amazing on stage. He said, it took me five years to make money from my podcast. Wow. And I realized I had made money on episode 11, season two, the guestless podcast, because when I went and interviewed the top biggest podcasters in the world, every single one of them said the same thing to me. You should monetize from day one. And I had already done a season, so I couldn't monetize from day one. So when I started season two, I told my audience immediately, hi, welcome back to the Guestless Podcast. I'm Jason and Scott. This is going to tell the story of me starting a business. And by the way, that business is this podcast. I'm going to show you how to make value out of a podcast. I'm going to get value from you to support me on this podcast. And together, we're going to learn how do we make money from a podcast? How do we promote a podcast? How do we scale a podcast? Like mm-hmm. this is the business and I'm going to find ways to sell off this and I'm going to find ways to make money off this and I'm going to share all of it with you live and transparently and I'm going to ask you for money. And the first thing I ever sold was a book. I sold a 999 book, which was um, The Eventrepreneur and I sold 55,000 copies. Now, again, I only had 2,000 
listeners. So how did I sell so many copies? Because I realized I had fans. So I had a way to say, if you buy 10 books, I'll send you an email to thank you. If you buy 50 books, I'll do a, a, a call out. If you buy 200 books, I'll mention you on the podcast. If you buy 500 mm -hmm. books, I'll get you as a guest on the podcast. If you buy a thousand books, I'll come to your college or university or business and do a talk. This is how we're going to do it together. And people bought books and books and books and books. And I, it was unbelievable seeing that fanship. People wanted to support me. And the same thing when I then did cups and hoodies and t-shirts and merchandise, they just kept supporting me. They just kept finding ways to support me. And then the truth is you only need a thousand people to spend a hundred dollars a year with you, which is less than $10 a month for you to make a six figure salary off a podcast. Wow. So, I think, I think we should repeat that one more time. So you only need a hundred people, a thousand people, a thousand people spending less than $10 or let's call it a hundred dollars a year to make six figures in podcasting. So let's wow. do the minutes, right? Or yeah. let's, let's go. Let's imagine we get them to spend a hundred dollars a month. Let's say we did a, a product, like we said, like AG1, Athletic Greens, mm -hmm. which is a traditional drink. So every month they pay a hundred bucks for 10 months. So we know a hundred times 10 is a thousand. If there's a thousand people, that's a thousand times a thousand. That's one million dollars. That's all it took. One product, one channel, one message. And by the way, Athletic Greens, you see it with Steve Bartlett, Diary of a CEO, constantly pushing Huel. Mm -hmm. Not, and he started by being an affiliate of Yule. And guess what now? He's a shareholder. He has got them to give him some of the ownership of that company. And he'll keep promoting it ad nauseum forever, for as long as he can. Because he now gets a bigger piece of a bigger pie. And I'll tell you where I got this idea from originally, which I see Steve's now doing and a lot of other people are doing. Mm -hmm. Beyonce was asked to sing for Uber at $7 million for 45 minutes. And she said, how about you just give me 5% of the company instead? Huh. And that made her smart at that. She's ever done. Exactly. And I thought, okay, I'm, I'm doing this wrong. And I think that's the thing, right? I have a, a, I have many mantras that, that shape my life. And one of the mantras is when in doubt, look about. That means someone else has probably worked this out already. Someone else has probably got the answer. Somebody else has probably shared the answer on a podcast or in an interview or on mm -hmm. some sort of TV show. You just got to go, instead of saying, how do I do this? Ask yourself, who has done this already that I can just copy from and replicate? I don't have to reinvent the wheel. So I always go to, don't worry about how many fans you have. Try and get a hundred fans that absolutely love you and then find a way to sell them something for a hundred bucks, whether that's 10 bucks a month or just one item for a hundred bucks and you suddenly have six figures and your profit margin is so high because you don't have cost of advertising. Your podcast is your advert. You don't have mm -hmm. cost of marketing. Podcast is your marketing. You don't have cost of content creation because you can repurpose your podcast into a newsletter and a blog and a Twitter thread and a thread thread. And you can use the videos to make TikTok videos and you can make the videos into YouTube shorts and you can make the videos into YouTube long form <laughs> content. So that's not costing you anything extra. That's just time. And you have time when you start, you in our life, we have, as a business person, we have two phases, right? We have a phase where we have so much time and no money. Mm -hmm. And then we go to the phase where we have almost no time and lots of money. Yeah. And all you've got to do is utilize that asset. When you have more time, use your time to make money. And later on, when you have more money, use that money to get other people to help you make more time. Wow. <laughs> that's a, that's been a roller coaster. And really, I, I completely agree with everything that you say, but hearing to what you've shared made me question you've come such a far long way and you've simplified podcasting in what five minutes already <laughs> um i want to ask you something more personal about your life can you share one of your most challenging entrepreneurial experiences and how you overcame it so i mentioned in the beginning that i grew up very poor uh, mm -hmm. eight people two bedroom house and a council house in Cape Town, South Africa in a place called uh, Brooklyn rugby. That was a, it wasn't a great time. And, and I wouldn't say it was the easiest of times growing up uh, until I was uh, 13, uh, 12 years old. And then I'm, we moved. But what I learned from that is that, and it's been the greatest lesson I've ever learned. 
everything is hard. Everything. Where most of my friends will at some point in their life or our friendship say, oh, that's easier said than done. You'll never hear me say that because I just assume everything is going to be hard. I have never started a business that was easy. I have never started a business that ran well. I've never, maybe the easiest business I ever started was I was in Thailand and we lost some kids during the monsoon. And when I said, what do you mean we lost some kids? And they said they drowned. And I just thought, that's crazy. Why are they drowning in like four feet of water? Like we could just teach them to swim. Yeah. And I went to the school and I said, can't we just send out a, a, a letter to every single parent saying, if you're happy to pay $25 a month, I'll teach your kids to swim. And that business just blew up because school after school after school was calling and saying, please teach our kids how to swim. Please teach our kids how to swim. And then I just started hiring people and I ended up building this massive swim school, which I sold, which is my first massive success. Mm -hmm. And that was possibly the easiest thing to sell, but execution was very hard. How did I find people who could swim that were happy to teach kids who could mm -hmm, swim? Mm -hmm. How do I know if they're safe with kids in the water? How do I know if they're going to pay attention to kids when they're in this danger situation? What do I do for three solid hours? Because they can't swim for three hours. So they'll do hour of swim, hour of play, an hour of homework. How do I know if, you know, nothing, there was so many challenges in that, you know, not, not to mention legalities and police checks and so every business I've started has been incredibly hard. And it, to be honest with you, every business I've started, I shouldn't have started. I have no right to start. I, I'm i not well educated. I did one year of business school. I was the first person in my family to finish high school. Like none of them finished high school. I had no one to turn to when I had problems. I sold a massive um, t-shirt deal. My very first company was called OPM, Other People's Money. And I managed to get this massive deal, $110,000 a month. So I would be a millionaire in 10 months. I was <laughs> so excited. I signed that contract so fast. I didn't even read the small print. <laughs> and my first shipment of T-shirts got lost from China to South Africa. And I thought, well, I, I, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I, I have no T-shirts. I have no company without T-shirts. It's a T-shirt printing company. And also, I didn't have the money for prints. I would get the T-shirts first, then go to a print shop. Then the print shop would print it. Then I would get another person to deliver it. And I called them up and they said, not a problem at all. So you deliver it, you know, 30 days late. And I thought, wow, what amazing people these are to give me this opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I got the T-shirts and I was late by, you know, 30 days. So it turned out 60 days after we signed that deal. I sent them an invoice and said, I need my money because I got the money to pay for the t-shirts. I spent every single cent I had to get the t-shirts across from China. And they said, oh, you didn't read the small print. We paid 210 days after delivery. 210 days. I didn't have them. And then I started to do the next month's order of the next t-shirts. And the month after that of the next t-shirts. And because I was poor, because I was uneducated, I went to all my poor friends and asked them, how do I get the money? And they said, well, you either steal the money, because that's what you do when you're poor, you go to crime, or you go to a loan shark. And I went to a loan shark and I said, do you mind borrowing me the money? And they said, of course, we'll borrow you the money. Just sign here. And I thought, great, <laughs> I'll, I'll take the money. And I didn't, you know, 40% interest month on month, three months later. Wow. My company. Yeah, I was gone. I was, that's why I moved to, I moved to Taiwan and then I moved to Thailand. I, I, it was so, absolutely frightening that I I just thought, I don't know how, I'm, and I was 27 years, I was 25. I left when I was 27. And I just thought, I don't know if I can ever do that again. That it was such a blow. And then when I started swimming school and the problem started mounting up, I asked myself the same question. Why am I doing this? I don't even know how to swim properly myself. Why am I trying to set up Asia's biggest swimming school? And I wasn't trying to be the biggest. I was trying to do one school. And then of course, mm -hmm. you know, all the know each other so you know second school and the third school and, and parents have two kids in two different schools so i another school and and when i sold that business uh you know i i i was like i don't know what i'm gonna do now and then i thought well i'll, I'm, I'll probably retire i'm 29 years old i'm i've sold this business for 2.1 million I'm, I'm gonna be absolutely sorted and then i got married which was very silly because i was very young and I didn't pay attention to my marriage and then i got divorced and i lost every single penny and I had to start again. And I thought, I, I don't know if I could do this. This will be my third time and I'm only 30 years old. And I got into health and fitness and I went to go work in gyms. I knew nothing about selling gyms and nothing about what that looked like. And I tried to think of a way to be different. So instead of selling a gym, which was built, I tried to sell gyms that weren't built yet. 
and get the money in advance and have all this extra cash and then go out. And that was a weirdly enough, a weird success. We sold to Richard Branson and became Virgin Active Gyms. And then a friend of mine said, why don't you get into events? And I thought, I know nothing about events. <laughs> and like, and then she said to me, I'll never forget this woman, amazing mm. woman, Justine. She said, you know nothing about nothing. You're the most uneducated person I know. You seem to always work it out. So just do what you've always done. And then I, I, I did. I, I found a company that was doing that. And I said, do you mind if I come work for you? I'll work for free because I had time. I didn't have money, but I had I had time. Um, and they said, sure. Uh, actually, I did, have, I did have money at the time. So I could have actually paid someone. I realize now as I'm saying this. <laughs> at the time, I remember thinking I don't have enough money so to buy my own building. Um, so I'll, I'll instead, I'll give up my time. And then I ended up doing that. And then I, I met someone who did own a building and he said, listen, why don't you come with me and we'll put our stuff together and we get our own venue. But every time it's scary. I think if you expect it to be scary, it changes everything. If you expect it to be hard, it changes everything. If you realize that every single thing that has ever been invented, has ever been built, has been made by people no smarter than you who were just as scared and it's okay to be scared. And the truth is when the brain says, be scared or you're an imposter, the brain's trying to help you. It's not being cruel. It's saying, get the evidence, do the work, prove to me that you're safe and I'll stop telling you you're scared. So you do the work and you meet people who've done it and you copy from them and you work beside them and you try and get some people to help you and you read some books on the subject and you watch YouTube videos and you listen to podcasts. And all of a sudden your brain stops telling you to be scared because your brain goes, you've got this, you've got enough information, you've, you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. You've said that life is hard and that you've built yourself back up multiple times, just by the three times by the age of 30. And that's a lot. And I think that shows so much determination and discipline. And you've talked about how your brain um, tells you that you're scared and how that keeps you going because you want to go for that safety. But I want to go deeper. How do you think all of these experiences and these life lessons have transformed you and have changed your work ethic? Would you say you're more cautious now or are you still a risk taker and do you still do many things that you don't know how to do because you know you're going to start learning them. I'm going to work backwards. I still do things that I have no idea what I'm doing. Mm. That That's 100%. Right now, I'm looking at a problem that's affecting 1.4 billion people. And it's rent. 1.4 billion people on the planet rent. And I'm thinking that's, that's a problem. That, that seems unfair that you just have to pay rent until what? you can finally afford to buy a house or you never can afford to buy a house. Why isn't there another opportunity? Why is it black or white? That, that seems mm -hmm. ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So the more I sort of look into that, the more the word FinTech comes up, right? That's a financial thing that you're trying to work out. You're trying to work out a technology, a technological way to fix a financial problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, Got no right to be in FinTech. I didn't study. I've got dyslexia. I see numbers backwards. It's called calculexia. I, I, I'm petrified of what that looks like. But then you said something else in your sentence, which I'll take on next, risk. I'm actually not a risk person. People think I am because I'm an entrepreneur, but that's not true. Mm -hmm. Warren Buffett said it best, look for hurdles you can step over. How do you make the risk so small that it doesn't seem that risky? So that's what I look to do. So when I, when I did the book, I didn't write a book and then sell a book. I asked my podcast audience, what would you like me to do? And email after email after email, LinkedIn not message of LinkedIn was write a book about events. You're in, you know, top 100 people in the world in events. And I thought, okay, I'm going to charge $9.99. Here's my PayPal account. And I thought if a hundred people pay, I'll go write the book. But I didn't think I'm going to write the book now because a hundred people said they want a book because that's still very risky because it'll take me <laughs> three months or four months or five months. Like I didn't know how long it's going to, I don't know how to, write. I said, I'm, I'm dyslexic. So I didn't know how long it was going to take to write a book and put all my thoughts in one place or how mm -hmm. I was going to put it together. So I pre-sold it. When I was in gyms, I mentioned the same thing. I went out and I spoke to business after business. And I said, 
the gym isn't built yet, but if you give me the money now, I'll have the gym ready in six months. And if I don't, I'll give you all your money back. And I've done that. I've come up with ideas where I've got people to pay and then I've tried to do it and I've realized it doesn't work. And I've just refunded everyone. And the great thing about that is now they trust you mm -hmm. because you did exactly what you said you would do. You took money and you gave it back when you couldn't deliver. So I've done that every time. I did it with swimming school. As I said, I got the parents to pay $25 per child per month before I went and set up the first swimming school. I always look at how can I lower that risk? So I start off by doing 20 hours of research. One of the great presidents of America, and they aren't many, said, if you give me eight hours to cut down a tree, I'll spend six hours sharpening the ax. And that is so important. There's no point going and chopping a tree with a blunt ax. It's going to take you forever. But if you take time to work out, actually, this is the best instrument I can use. And this is the thing I'm going to use it for. Mm -hmm. So I take 20 hours. I put a marker on. That's all I'm going to spend. I'm going to find people that did it. I'm going to speak to journalists because journalists will ask questions that no one else is asking. I'll speak to people who've invested in that area because they're asking crazy questions because they're scared to lose their money. I'm going to speak to people who've done it, who've done well at it. I'm going to speak to people who failed at it and find out what I shouldn't do when I start this next project. And then I'm going to go to the people I think I'm helping and say, pay me. <laughs> because if they go, nah, I'm not going to pay you, then it's not a real problem. Mm -hmm. And my risk goes through the roof. I think what people don't understand about business is it's not about finding problems. It's about knowing the difference between a vitamin shop and a hospital. Anyone can walk in a vitamin shop and think I'm deficient in calcium. I need more magnesium. I need more iron. I need more vitamin D. But people walk out of vitamin shops without buying vitamins all the time and they don't feel guilt about it. They go mm -hmm. straight off and buy ice light latte. But you find someone who's just broken their leg going to a hospital. If they don't get sorted with that leg, they will beg, cry, and plead and offer all kinds of money for you to fix that leg. Mm -hmm. You want to be in the hospital business, not the vitamin business. When the two guys who invented Google were crossing a parking lot and someone said, why aren't you at university? And they said, well, we've realized the internet will be a bunch of words and we're going to find like the perfect librarian to find you anything you're looking for. That guy said, don't move, ran to his car, wrote a check for $100,000, ran back and said, I want to be your first investor. That's when they knew they had a real product before they did anything. And, and I remind myself of that. Find, know where your audience is. Know that it's a real pain, not a vitamin. Ask them to pay. Test how much they'll pay. Take the money so your risk is even lower. Mm -hmm. And just be clear about it. If you don't get it right, give them their money back because they will trust you with the next idea and the next idea and the next idea. And that's what I do. And that means it's not risky. It means I feel really confident when I take on a problem because I already have money and I already know people who want to get involved and I already know where to find my my audience, right? Like when I started a podcast, classic example, I started a podcast, not another crypto show. Let's use that as an example. I went on Reddit and I just looked at how many tens of thousands of people were asking questions about crypto and blockchain. When I did smarter event planning, I looked at how many EAs and PAs, personal assistants, executive assistants, were asking questions about how do I organize events? I didn't get this job to organize events. I thought I'd be managing calendars. And I thought I'd be, you know, mm -hmm. booking communities between my boss. And I thought, okay, there's tens of thousands of them. I only need to get 1%. 1%. If I get 1% of the people to listen to my podcast and I find a way to sell them something for 100 bucks a year, I have a six-figure business just out of my podcast. And what if I could do that up front? What if I could go to the PA show, which is a show in London, and I could walk around person to person and say, hey, we've got the show coming out. Would you like to be a subscriber? Can you give me your email? Because I need an action. It's easy to say yes, but get an action. Give me your email address. Then I sent them a, you know, a link to the trailer and people mm -hmm. subscribed. You could see how many subscribers I had before I even did episode one. And then I did episode one to three. And I knew I had a little bit of a bulk. And then I started. Wow. That's that's crazy and fantastic at the same time. Um, so Jason, you went from swimming to gym to events planning. And now I'm going to take you back to podcasting because I really want to know, you've met so many people, you've been in so many industries, you must have grasped information from every aspect. So this question will probably be easy for you to answer. As the founder of Podcasting for Business, what do you believe are the essential elements of a successful podcast? What are the key things that you see that or that you notice instantly when you take a look or a listen at a podcast? Okay. 
So firstly, um, I, I am, you know, the founder of podcasting for business, but it's not a business. It's, I just put everything that I learned about podcasting onto a course and I put a course up because I was doing lots of these calls and lots of these talks all over the world. And I realized that I couldn't help enough people one-to-one. -one. So I was like, I'll just put it up as a course and people can message me and I can help. I can, they can buy the course directly or if they're a charity, I can give it to them for 75%. Mm -hmm. I also learned that if you don't charge, if you don't, people don't pay, they don't pay attention. So when I used to give the course for free, which I did for a year, people just didn't start podcasts or they didn't make any money. And I was like, what am I doing wrong? And then I realized, okay, if I charge some money, people will then pay and then they'll pay attention and then they'll follow through and they'll build podcasts. So I was like, great. So that's what podcasting for business is. Um, the thing that I've noticed is, is a lot of things. The first thing I noticed is you have to care. You have to care about what your podcast is about. That's number one. If you do not care, you cannot continue to do it. You mentioned, you sent me this brilliant email about questions and thoughts for today's podcast, which was excellent. And one of the things you mentioned was how many podcasts exist. And I think in your email, you said five, or maybe it was 7 million podcasts, right? And you can see you checking your notes. How many, how many podcasts? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, depending on who you look at, they seem to have different stats. So listen notes says there's 5 million. Apple says there is just over 5 million. Spotify says there's 7 million. There's 750,000 podcasts that have more than three episodes. There's 325,000 episodes that have more than 10 episodes. That's tiny. That is my newt. There, there are 110 million YouTube channels. Channels, not even like, like full on show, just channels. There's over 3 billion Facebook pages, right? That is... That's a lot. That competition for podcasts is so small. You've got such a good chance of winning if the wow. first thing you do is you care. The second is make more than three episodes and you've already beat over 3 million podcasts. Make more than 10 episodes, you've beat more than five, you know, over 7.5 million podcasts. Like what a chance. Okay, next. Do you know who your audience is? I mean, if I do a podcast for uh, event planners, do I know that there's an actual event planner out there that wants to listen to a podcast? Do I know what his or her life is like? If I do a podcast that's three hours long and my EA only has a 30 minute break and then a 20 minute commute home, they're not going to listen to a three hour podcast. So I need to know who my audience is. That's the second thing that's massive. So when I did EAPA, I did 30 minutes because when I called around and said, how long is the average break for a PA? They said 30 <laughs> minutes. So I was like, great. Then I looked at what's the average commute. The average commute is 58 minutes uh, in Western countries, right? So I was like, cool, if I can do a 27 minute episode, maybe they'll listen to two episodes in a row. Maybe one at lunch and one on their trip, or maybe one on the trip on the way there, one on the trip on the way home. That's double, I double my downloads, okay? Next, can I give them value on every single episode? Every episode, can they take off their headset and go, I learned one thing that I can now go into the world and do and when someone sees me do it, they go, where did you learn how to do that? And I go, oh, from this podcast, because <laughs> now I've got free advertising, I've got free marketing, because word of mouth is still 76% reason why people find podcasts. 76%, you'd be mad not to create something sticky. Then, <laughs> who are the biggest podcast platforms? Apple, Spotify, YouTube. YouTube has 22 algorithmic factors. Very difficult to to hack YouTube. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. What about Insta? What about uh, Spotify? Spotify has a multitude of algorithmic factors. They won't share any of them publicly. Okay. What about Apple? Apple has five, just five. Did someone listen for more than five minutes? Did they click subscribe? Did they give you five stars? Did they leave a comment? And then did your numbers double? Now, the fifth one seems the most difficult. Right? Because you think, well, doubling numbers, that's big. Mm -hmm. But not if you've got one listener. And then the next day you have two listeners. Cool. And the next day you have four listeners. And the next day you have eight listeners. And then and you know how you do that? You start setting up an email tree. We're on day one of putting your podcast out. You email one person and say, Do you mind if you listen to my podcast? And the next day you email two people. And the next day you email four people. And you make sure to listen to it yourself. And you ask all of them the same thing. Subscribe, listen for more than five minutes. Give me five stars. It can't be less than five stars, by the way. The algorithm won't work. <laughs> but what happens when you get that right for one week, just seven days straight or 10 days straight or eight weeks is Apple's absolute number. 
Apple will promote you to other shows that are exactly like yours for free. A trillion dollar company, the most valuable company in the world will get behind you and say, this show has value. You should listen to it. It'll put you on charts. It will put you on lists. It will promote you for free. And people don't know that. So what do people say on podcasts? I hope you've enjoyed our podcast and you listen to it wherever you find good podcasts. Find the links for Spotify, Apple, YouTube. (laughs) No, one, one, force everyone to go to Apple for your first two to three seasons. Just push Apple. If they go listen on something else, great, it's a bonus, but it's not what you want. You want just Apple. You want to promote Apple as much as you can because Apple wants people to go there because Apple still thinks they invented podcasting, even though they didn't. Because they think <laughs> iPod and broadcast podcast. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's not where it came from. It came from way before that um, by two guys. Anyway, so that's the next thing I look at. Then I ask them, what's the business model? What's your business model? How, how are you going to make money out of this? And a lot of people say, well, I won't make money. Not true. Of course you'll make money, but let's let's really talk it through. How do you make money from this? And they'll say, well, Jason, I have a, um, I'm a speaker, right? And I'll say, great. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to find out who are the biggest bookers for speakers in your area. Get them on your podcast. Find out what they look for in speakers. Find out how much they pay speakers. Find out when their next events are. And then you've got all this information to email them and say, by the way, did you know that I was a speaker? Did you enjoy me talking to you? Did you find me valuable? Did you? I'm going to send you an email. Though, and now you've got, it's your first way to make money. So the first way you make money on a podcast is to sell directly to your guest. Your second is to sell to your guest's audience. So you go, I know Jason's audience cares about business and podcasts. I'm going to get Jason on the show. He's going to bring his audience. Now I'm talking directly to them. And perhaps I mentioned in my show that I'm a speaker and I've just finished a keynote talk in Vegas and for 5,000 people. And it was a massive success. Now those people are going, wow, maybe we should book her for a talk. Okay. Yeah. That's really interesting. Then you go to number three. You think to yourself, I wonder if businesses would pay to be connected to Jason. Well, Jason talks about podcasting. What if I could get Acast to sponsor the episode where I talk to Jason? Or if they would love an email with Jason, or if they if I get Jason to say he loves Acast, well, that's a case study. It's an advert. It's a piece of content they can create. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they'll pay $500 for that. Okay. I'm going to send them an email. I'm going to send 10 different companies an email saying, would you like to sponsor this episode with Jason? This is what I'm going to get him to talk about. Because you've already got your email. You know exactly what I'm going to talk about. Then so that's access, right? Access to your guests. So we've said access to your guest directly, access to your guest audience, then a third party, a business to have access to your guests, then a third party to have access to your guest's audience. And then you can do organic mentions. So you could say to 10 companies that you actually believe in, hey, I'd love to mention you at the end of my show. I've got 10 quick fire questions. So one of my questions is my favorite piece of software is Evernote. What's your favorite piece of software? If mm-hmm. Evernote pays you $50 for that question, you don't have to say it's a paid advert because you're saying it organically. If the person says, I've never used Evernote, you get to then explain what Evernote is, which is an advert, without having to say it's an advert. If they say, I love Evernote and I use it all the time, you get to now clip that as a piece of content, send that to Evernote. They've now got this great piece of advert advertising, which is wonderful. And if you've got $50 per question, 10 questions, $500, 10 episodes in a season, you just made five grand for yourself off a podcast. And it was no extra work except a couple of emails anyway. And there's a, a fantastic book by a Chet Holmes and Amanda Holmes. I think it's called The Sales Machine. And they talk about something called the Dream 100. Who are the 100 people that simply by knowing them can change the trajectory of your life? That's what I use podcasts for. I wanted to meet a guy called Dan Fleischman. Dan Fleischman is the biggest social media influencer booker in the world. He knows the Kardashians. He knows everyone. I can never get on a cold call with him. I'm nobody to this guy. He's the youngest person ever on the London Stock Exchange. I cannot get him into, I can't pay tickets to get close to him. But I found out that he really likes money and he likes to talk about money. So I started a podcast called the Make Money Podcast and it took me 11 episodes And I emailed him every time I finished an episode and I went after all his friends. So his friends would go, oh, I know Jason Scott. I just did a podcast with him. Oh my, I just did Jason Scott's podcast. Oh, I just did Jay. And then he said, okay, Jason, you got me. Let's do a podcast. Once I finished that, I closed the whole show down. I didn't need to do anything. I now had a (laughs) friend, my dream guy who can book me as a speaker, who can fly me around the world, who I can invest in his companies like Asahi and Everbold and Cards and Coffee with Gary Vee, which now gets me in a room with Gary Vee and 
So that's what I'm doing all the time. Who are the hundred people? Sarah Blakely, the inventor of Spanx, said, if I could just get a friendship with Oprah, Oprah will put Spanx on TV. Every lady that watches that show will go out and buy Spanx. It will change my life forever. I just need to find a way to get in front of Oprah. And that's what she did. And that's what happened exactly like she planned it. That's what I use podcasting for. Whether I have 10 listeners or 10 million listeners, it makes no difference. I know that my success metric is you first and foremost, a friendship, a relationship, a value exchange, a straightforward cash exchange, a piece of equity for what you're doing, an affiliate commission. And I work that out first. And then I start thinking about everything else. And the other thing is to realize starting a successful podcast, which is your original question, is that it has to be real to your audience. It doesn't have to be real to you. This idea that you have to really care about anything, it's not true. You have to care about it enough to do more than 10 episodes. Absolutely. But if you can make it that your audience can feel your connection to it. And there's always two ways to do that. One is you come in as an expert. I'm an expert about the subject. I'm going to bring in other experts. We're going to talk about it on a high level. Or two, you just be completely honest like I was with the crypto show and go, I know nothing. I know less than nothing. And you're going to learn as I learn. I'm going to ask the silly questions that you're too scared to ask in public. I'm going to admit that I don't know what a blockchain is and a meta wallet and a, and people will laugh in the beginning. You'll get comments, but you'll get engagement. People will go, wow, I can't believe you were, you were honest enough to admit you didn't know this. And, and that audience will build. And then you give away just, if you can aim for one to three things per episode that adds value to someone's life, it makes a massive difference. And the last thing is what's called the Lamborghini meme concept. <laughs> if you put a meme with a Lamborghini, you'll get, a lot of likes. If you do a, a meme that explains how to make the money to afford a Lamborghini, you get less likes. Why? Because people want to be entertained first and educated second. So always add the sugar to the medicine. Try and be inter entertaining and then add some value, some education. Don't try and just be educational. People do not care. They need to be entertained first. You need to add all the sugar to your medicine. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Every single time I ask you a question, I just get so much information. I I just have to sit down and breathe and say, this guy is amazing. Jason, <laughs> I, I really admire how you narrow it down and simplify it, but you've got me thinking. If you simplify podcasting and how to make a successful chain of episodes, in such a quick and easy way to understand for the youth, especially, I want to, again, narrow it down for specifically teenagers, students that have had a podcast in their mind that have wanted to start but don't know where to start. You've mentioned to always use the time effectively, to send emails, which could be replaced with the time that you could spend doom scrolling for the, us, the younger generation. What are some of the common mistakes these people should avoid? Oh, very good question. When you do a direct message, let's say you DM a particular guest or you email a particular guest or you send a LinkedIn message, always start with what you can give them. And don't ask them what they can give them because if they had the time to work that out, they'd probably do it themselves or give it to one of their staff members. So you want to sort of go in and say something like, and I'm just going to use some examples. So you might you might be really good that you mentioned um, being on social media, right? So maybe you're mm -hmm. good at replying to comments. So you, which is people don't even understand is a skill. It's not actually really easy to reply well enough that the person who made the original post responds to your post. Maybe you watch a lot of YouTube videos, and while you make YouTube videos, you're writing notes, and now you mm -hmm. can go into the comments and you can be like. Chapter one, he's, this was the question, this was the answer. Chapter two, this is the question. And you put that in the comments of YouTube. That's that's powerful because if they haven't done that, that means either they don't understand the value of that or they just don't have the time. So you could start by saying, hey, Jason, I love your work. I have a, a podcast. Before I get into that, I want to talk about what I can do for you. I would love to look at your last 10 episodes on YouTube that I found. These are the episodes here and I've created chapters in them. The question you've asked, the answer you've asked. Or... I found this episode you did on a podcast that I loved, which is why I want you on my show. And I've clipped it up. There are five clips attached to this email that you can now use on your social media. I'm going to be doing the same thing for the podcast that you and I do. I want it to be of value. Or I've seen that you're currently working on this from your LinkedIn. Perhaps you need someone to research it. I'm happy to give you 
five hours of my time to research this thing that you're looking for because I can see you're really interested in it and maybe you don't have the time, but I'm really good at research. I can doom scroll for hours. I can find <laughs> the best influencers in the space. I can find out what's trending, what hashtags working, mm -hmm. what's connecting people, what subreddits exist. Start with value. Start with this is the thing I'm giving you. And now turn around and you can say, sounds like an alarm going. Now mm -hmm. you can turn around and say, um, this is what I this is what I'd like. I have a show and then talk about story. Never talk about stats. Yes, if your show is doing millions of listeners, talk stats endlessly. How many countries, how many people, what age group, but talk story. My podcast is for Gen Zs who are going into business. And I'm trying to make an easy way for them to understand the right moves to make so that they move smart, that they work smart, not work hard. That's the point of my show. I chose you because, and then add a thing. I've watched three of your episodes, as I mentioned, and you talked about this. And I love the way you talked about that. And this is really interesting. Then you want to make it personal, right? And this is very powerful. You want to say, my name's Sonia. I am this old. I've been doing this many episodes. I've had these great episodes. This I've had more comments than anyone similar to my show. Now that's important because comment shows them engagement. Mm -hmm. Comments are more powerful than how many people listen. I say this often, you want to be Jesus or Hitler. Hitler had <laughs> more followers. Jesus had 12, but his 12 were very powerful, far more powerful than Hitler's millions. So talk about the engagement. And then you want to make it dead easy to book time. I can work around your schedule. Or you can use my calendar link below where we can book in a time that works for both of us. But I am here to give you as much value as possible. I will be calling you back. I'll be emailing you back. I'll be DMing you back in five days at one o'clock. And then you email exactly five days later at one o'clock and that'll show them a bunch of things. It shows them you're exact, you're congruent. You say what you're going to do and you do exactly what you say. You've offered value to begin with. You're a real person. You have a real audience that is engaged. That's all people are looking for. And then don't give up. One of the, the great shows out there is Harry Stebbings, 20 BC. Every single Sunday, Harry sends out 100 emails to 100 of the biggest guests he can think about. He is, a, he makes, firstly, he makes millions out of his podcast, which is incredible. But he also has now millions of downloads. He started off three years ago and he stick to the same schedule every single Sunday. He sends out emails. He sends out direct messages. He mentions on Twitter, these are the people I've just messaged. So people on Twitter can go around. He's incentivized that now because obviously he has a lot more money. So he'll say, if you can help me get in front of Ryan Reynolds for my next episode, I'll give you $250 Amazon voucher or I'll give you $1,000. <laughs> like he can afford to do that now, right? Because he's got more money than time. Yeah. As opposed to back in the beginning when he started, he just had time. He was brand new to, to everything that he did. So that's what I would do. If I was starting out again, I would be like, who are the top 100 people that can change my trajectory of my life? That can really help me. They can get me in the right business or get me the right job or get me the right experience. In, in your particular stage of life, you are, in, in both our particular stages of life, it's learn and earn, right? When you're younger, you should focus more on learning than earning. And at my age, I should be focused predominantly on earning because my earning time is running out mm -hmm. and my earning time will continue until I die. So you've got to kind of look at that all the time. Am I doing this podcast because I'm going to learn something or I'm doing this podcast because I'm going to earn something? And you should be looking at that gauntlet for every single person you're bringing on. What is the reason I'm doing this? Ask yourself those hard questions. Why am I bringing this? Am I just a fan? Well, that's okay if I am just a fan, but could I get more out of this? Could I learn how they came up with the song? Why they came up with that meme? Why they put, could I find a formula that will give my audience something that they can take off their headphones and immediately go do that people. So you're going back to your basics over and over and over. And then of course, the most important thing is never, ever lie to yourself. You can lie to the world. Don't lie to yourself. If you're doing mm -hmm. a podcast, about me, be honest about that. I'm doing this to make money. And when it doesn't, delete what didn't work, double down on what did, look at the stats that you have, look at what resonated with people in the comments um, or email people directly and ask them, hey, I've noticed you didn't subscribe to my show. You didn't leave a comment. You didn't give me five stars. And I sent you an email two weeks ago. What happened? <laughs> you know, can you give me a reason why you didn't listen? But it's just all I'm asking for is five minutes, five stars and a comment and a subscription. Um, and that, by the way, so for those people who are listening, if you want another hack, Apple's charts are purely based on how many follow how many um, people do those things. It's not based on anything else. So if you only wow. had 100 listeners and you had 100 five stars and 100 comments and 100 subscribers, you will have an equal chance of going against Joe Rogan with millions and millions of listeners. 
That's crazy. And actually, um, what you said about the, especially at the start of uh, your answer with the LinkedIn, with what are you offering the others? I just wanted to emphasize that because I think it's such, such an important thing. I obviously have way less expertise than you do um, in everywhere, but I've obviously, I've actually been the judge at my school for a couple of public speaking competi competitions. I've, uh, I love marketing and I've done some internships for marketing agencies. And what I very often see is people stick to themselves being more, not selfish, but self-centered in the terms of they always ask the other person for the help and they don't think how impactful it could be if they first of all say what they could bring to the other person i think that's such such a very the very first thing that you notice at in a person and say yes this person is different i want this person on my team i want this to be my new employee so i just wanted to emphasize that and i was actually researching this while i was editing my LinkedIn bio since I just recently turned 16. <laughs> so I put my mission in the very first. Jason, um, you advocate. Sorry. Hmm. Sorry? No, apologies, please. You advocate for individual empowerment through your work. How can young people cultivate a mindset of empowerment and resilience in their personal and professional lives? Mm. Well, resilience is a muscle. <laughs> so unfortunately, we need hard times to become resilient. I wish there was another way around it. But if you never have anything bad happen to you, then it's really hard to resist. I've got a brother. Um, he's 16 years younger than me. He came into the world when I was 16. And he's not resilient. He's amazing. I love him. I love him to bits. Um, but he's not resilient at all. When And it's because nothing bad has happened during his lifetime. He grew up and my dad had a good job where he got married to his mom. And his mom had a good job and they lived in a nice house at that period. And the worst thing that happened was the two of them got divorced, um, his mom and his dad. But then he got a, he got into a good school and he got into a great college and then he got a great job. Someone offered him a job and then he got, he, then he got headhunted to another job and each job paid more. And then he got this amazing apartment on the beach in South Africa. And then he, he got this car that he really wanted since he was 16. And then he got another car that he wanted because of a bonus and, so he's got no resilience. So when something terrible just recently happened, well, his first breakup, um, he he doesn't know how, he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't he mm -hmm. doesn't understand that predominantly life will just get harder as you age. That the best thing you can do is realize that the pain is guaranteed. Everything else is a bonus. So what I said to him is. Firstly, this is a blessing. It doesn't feel like a blessing now, and it hurts a lot. And breaking up is so painful. And mm -hmm. you're going to read stupid things like smile that it happened, don't cry that it's gone. And that is true, and it'll make sense down the line, but it doesn't make sense right now. But this is the first time that you can exercise your resilience muscle. You can say, I can bounce back from this. And you can mm -hmm. journal your feelings, how it felt at the time, what you were going through. And then when it happens again, you go back to your journal and you read what you told yourself at the time. And you remind yourself you survived that, which means you'll survive the next thing. And you'll probably survive the next thing. And if you're lucky, you'll survive the next thing because these things will just keep coming. People in your life will die. You will have breakups. You will have failures. I had a, a company called Venue Me. I did it just after events. And I did it at the same mm -hmm. time that I did podcast, the guest was podcast. And it wasn't a failure. It was a fiasco. It was the greatest failure of my entire career. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong. It was Murphy's Law. My CTO, when he was asked what code he was building my technology in, he said English. English is not a code, right? <laughs> he was. I was just paying this guy without even knowing that he knew nothing. He was watching Silicon Valley, the TV show, and inventing words to impress me, and I just didn't know. I asked so many people, if they wanted the product, they all said yes, but I forgot to charge them. So when the product came out and I spent all the money, no one bought it. And it was an absolute flop. And I did this YouTube video to like explain it. That didn't work. Like nothing worked. But I learned that I could get back up and I could start again. And that no one really remembered that I failed so badly. <laughs> no one remembered that I had an entire podcast where I explained every single step of my business and that it was a massive failure. 
<laughs> I, I learned, and I said this to my brother, like there's a, a rule called 20, 40, 60. In your 20s, you think everyone's thinking about you. In your 40s, you stop caring if people are thinking about you. And in your 60s, you realize no one was thinking about you. They were mm -hmm. thinking about themselves, their own problems, their own pains. So realize that when you try something, realize that when you're exiting something, and then realize that resilience is a muscle that unfortunately needs to be put under pressure. It needs to be, you need to feel pain to learn how to be better with pain. Then mm -hmm. realize as the ties would say, poos happen. It's always gonna happen. It's, there is always gonna be rainy days. It's not important to notice the rainy days. It's important to notice when the sun shines, when it's beautiful, when they honor mm -hmm. rain. That's the parts to notice. Pain is inevitable. So that's what I would, that would be my advice to anyone is kind of realize that you are going to survive it because most people survive it. When every hero you've ever hero worshipped became a hero because they went through tough times. Mm -hmm. Because if you were making something hard, you would have to put a lot of pressure under it. Diamonds are made by putting so much pressure on coal. If they were just left as coal, they would just be coal. They'd never become diamonds. And we all kind of want to be diamonds, but none of us want that pressure. <laughs> That's a great example to use, I think. And James, uh, Jason, sorry, how can young individuals start building their influence and credibility from an early stage? Because you've talked about podcasting. You've talked about using brands to add value to yourself. You've talked about how you can scale up your podcast but how about building influence and credibility? So there's two ways to do that. Uh, there's an easy way and a hard way. I'll give you both. The easy way is take people who already have credibility and brand awareness and steal it. How do you steal it? You have a podcast with them, right? The moment you see your name and Seth Godin, people assume you must know marketing because Seth Godin's the godfather of marketing. So mm -hmm. this is stealing social clout, right? Simply by being, that's why we take selfies with celebrities because we're kind of saying, look, we're the same. <laughs> they have a head, I have a head. They have shoulders, I have a shoulders. They smile, I smile. They have teeth, I have teeth. Or they're good looking, I must be good looking. Or they're talented, I'm talented. So that's what we do it. That's why, you know, you have buskers where the celebrity comes and dance, sings with them their famous song and it blows up because they're saying, hey, we're equal. And the more you do that, that stealing of social clout, the more people you bring on your show, the more people see your name and their name together, the more the brain goes, there's a link. Oh, this person knows marketing. They interview mm -hmm. marketing experts. And every time I listen to them, they're a marketing expert. That leads us to the second one. Do what you say. Tell people what you're going to do and then show that you did it over and over. And that one takes longer. That mm -hmm. congruent, that's hard. It's so hard right? And there's so much of this hashtag build in public and it's scary because you're like, I'm going to build a merchandise company. I'm going to start the next represent, or I'm going to, you know, become the next influencer on TikTok. And mm -hmm. then you don't, and you're like, wow. But if you said it differently, if you said, I'm going to try and create content for the next hundred days, one video a day, every day for a hundred days. And then you did it. You get to look back and go, I just did it. And everyone that followed you on that journey goes, yes, you did. And now we trust you. And now we believe in you. And now you have that thing that you were chasing the whole time. You didn't have to steal it from someone else. Casey mm -hmm. Neistat has been really interesting recently. He said, no one can take away the fact that I did 800 videos on YouTube. No one can say I didn't do it. No one can say I didn't deserve the success of camp. I did, the, I did it every single day for a year, just like I said I would. And then suddenly everyone trusted me. Everyone believed in me. Same with Mr. Beast. Because they said they would do a thing, then went out and did the thing. Failure or success, mm -hmm. we believe in them. Jeff Jeff Bezos, everyone talks about Amazon. No one talks about the Amazon phone. It was a massive failure. It was terrible. No one talks about it because we don't care. We we He said he would do a thing. He did a thing. He continues to do a thing. That's what we're looking for. So that's what, that would be my advice. And you can start small. It doesn't have to be big. Just be mm -hmm. like, I'm going to do a podcast every week for 10 episodes. And you're going to get to watch me do it on right here or listen to me every week on Wednesday. And I'm not going to miss a Wednesday for 10 weeks. And the following time, once you've proven that, you can say, hey, everyone, did you know that I said I would do 10? And I did 10. For the next 10, I'm going to bring the best people in X on the show. So now you can do double. Now you're saying you're going to do a thing, you're doing a thing, and you're taking someone else's social proof. And that's powerful. 
then mm-hmm. you do the same thing the next time. And you just keep, and I'll tell you what else that does, which is a, a pure bonus. The brain goes, we can trust this person because they keep saying they'll do a thing and they keep doing a thing. That's why cold plunging is so big right now and running is so big right now. And because you're literally saying, I'm going to get up every morning, no matter if it's cold or rain, and I'm going to run. You're saying, no matter how cold that water is, I'm going to go into it. And then you do it. Mm-hmm. You're telling your audience that you're doing it. You're telling your brain that you'll do it. And everyone just starts believing you because you keep proving you're going to do the thing you said you would do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you think there are any practices or habits so you can stick consistent that maybe yes. perhaps you even implement in your life? 100% yes. Two things or three. The first is if it's not scheduled, it isn't done. Just put it in your, put it in your calendar, right? Like every day, block, block book it. There it is. I'm mm-hmm. going to read a chapter every day between 9 and 10 a.m. I'm not going to do meetings. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to do calls. Okay, I'm t- my phone goes off in focus and I read a chapter. Number one. So block book. Beautiful thing. Two, streaks. I know it sounds silly, but you do something two days in a row and you tell yourself, oh my gosh, I just did three days in a row. Oh, I just did something four days in a row. I just So I stopped drinking December 31st, 2020. I was only going to do January. That's it. Just dry January. I'd never done it. I've been drinking since I was 15. It's like part of culture. You got mm-hmm. parties, mm-hmm. whatever. And I was like, and then I was like, oh, I did a month. I wonder if I could do two months. Oh, I wonder if I did three months. I had no plans on stop drinking. I'm three, three years, six months in. And I'm like, I wonder if I can just do one more day, mm-hmm. not even like a month or right? one more day. So streak streaks work. I'm currently using my fitness pal to like track food. And it tells me I'm 56 days in a row. I've been tracking my food. So streaks work really wow. well. Third is something called identity shifting. Instead of saying, I'm going to go for a run, start saying I'm a runner. Cause you know what mm-hmm. that tells the brain runners run. So you have to run to call yourself a runner. If you're thinking about writing, write. Don't tell people you're going to write a book. Start writing a book. When people ask what you're doing, don't say, I'm writing a book. Say, I'm a writer and mm-hmm. I'm writing a book. Mm-hmm. Identity. I'm, I'm a podcaster. I'm a content creator. I shape stories from people and add value to people's lives. That is a massive difference too. I do a show once a week where I interview people. There's no identity to that. Mm-hmm. If you can mm-hmm. put your identity around something, something happens to us a neuro pathway is created where our brain goes, oh yeah, that's true. We are that thing. We keep doing that thing. We prove that we're that thing. Okay, well, if we're that thing, we have to act accordingly. If we're saying we're an athlete, we have to do athletics in some shape or form. If we're saying mm-hmm. we're content, we need to be caught in content. So all those other things are created. And I do that in my own life. Like I I say to people, I'm, I'm going to write a book. Then I realize, well, that doesn't help me. I don't seem to start a book. But if I say, oh, I'm an author, I write books. And I'm currently writing every day, one chapter a day between nine and 10, because it's block booked in my diary. So I add all three things. And I'm currently on day 56 of writing wow. my book. Yeah. And I and I don't start with a blank. By the way, anyone that's ever written a book, I got this advice from, from um, Stephen King. Never start with a blank page. Like either start just writing angry things because passion can transmute to other things or copy and paste a chapter of something you like. And then slowly start changing the words and your brain will go, oh, you're writing. And then you could delete it and start and just keep writing and delete the stuff that you copied from someone else. But it'll it'll help. It seems to work every time. I don't know why, but it totally kills writer's block. As a writer of four books myself, I think that message just instantly stuck in my mind. Now, uh, especially because lately I've been trying to do so many things. I have seen the sort of writer's block start kicking in. So yeah, I'll take Stephen King's advice. <laughs> that's Stephen that's really advice. write from anger. Get angry about something. I yeah. guarantee you'll be right about it. Mm-hmm. So to sum up what you say, uh, what you said, blocking it in your schedule, starting a streak, and identity shifting. Yeah. And now, Jason. I- and before we get off, as any parting advice. For any young listeners just starting out their careers, what do you want to leave them with? If I may, I'd like to leave them with two things. The first is what what success is. If you don't know what success is, you will constantly be chasing what other people tell you success is. If people tell you that success is having lots of relationships, you'll have lots of relationships and never feel happy because that wasn't what you thought success was. If people say it's having lots of money, you'll always be chasing money. And when you finally get money and you're not happy, you're going to go, what happened? Why wasn't I happy with that? Or a new car or a new house or whatever. Define for yourself what success is and be 
to absolutely concentrate on that. You can be flexible about how you get there, but always remember that thing. Otherwise, you get on something called the hedonic treadmill, which means you're always chasing this thing that just keeps moving and you never seem to get it because you've mm -hmm. never been really focused on what success is. Just take the time, stop what you're doing, spend 10 minutes, five minutes, and go, this is what success looks like. If you can mm -hmm. in a perfect world, find someone who has that success and ask them if it was good enough for them. What was mm -hmm. the journey like to get it? Was it worth having it? So for me, success is freedom. So that's that's every time I someone offers me a ridiculous amount of money to do something or a business or whatever, I think I have to work a hundred hours. And they go, Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Do I have to have meetings? Oh gosh, yeah. Do I have to live in London? Or think, yes, no. <laughs> for me, success is being able to go on a Tuesday and book a flight absolutely anywhere with anyone and just do what I want every single day. So that's what success is. And the last is to realize that in the end, only three things count. Did you live? Did you really live in this one life that you have? Did you love? Did you get to love someone, love something? And did you matter at least to one person, even if that one person is yourself? Everything else is Fugazi. It's fairy dust. It won't be remembered. We don't talk about the queen and she was pretty darn special in the United Kingdom. We don't talk about Genghis Khan. We don't talk about King Pullenball V in Thailand, who was the greatest king of Thailand's time. We don't talk about Nelson Mandela, who was the greatest leader of South Africa. We don't talk about Evita, that was the greatest leader of Argentina. And I could go on and on and on. All those people were incredible. Gandhi in India. Why? Because in the end, none of that mattered. Did you matter? Did you live? Did you love? Did you matter to at least one person, even if that one person is you? Wow. <laughs> left me speechless again and Jason I think that's been an amazing finish to today's episode and I'd like to thank you for being on the podcast and for agreeing to this opportunity <laughs> thank you thank you before we continue I want to talk to you briefly about this amazing organization called SOS Children's Villages SOS Children's Villages Romania has been providing children in need with a safe, clean home, healthy food, a good education, and the love and the care that they need. I know they're literally saving children's lives as I had the chance to donate books to them and sit down and talk with them. All donations are highly appreciated and you can donate online to SOS Children's Villages Romania at the link in the description below and change a child's life forever. I've learned so much from Jason in this past hour, I cannot even tell you. It's it's crazy to think that you can actually make so much money from podcasting alone. I gotta be honest with you and tell you that while I was sitting down and having this conversation, I was constantly wide-eyed. Did you learn something new? I definitely did. I've learned things that I didn't even know. I mean, I knew podcasting was great, but now... I'm going to start implementing Jason's advice and Jason's knowledge into this podcast itself. <laughs> I want to ask you something. If this episode taught you anything, and I bet it did, or learned something new, or it sparked your interest or curiosity in podcasting, it would mean so much to me if you could please share it with your friends and family or anyone that you know that loves podcasting in general and leave a five stars review because sharing these episodes and doing this is what helps the Smarter Podcast continue bringing valuable content and amazing guests to you. And if no one tells you today, I want to be the first that says, I believe in your ability to build the life that you want and it's never too late to begin. And I wish you the most amazing week ahead. Bye bye. <laughs>